Well, good morning, everyone, all the way from sunny Wisconsin. It was actually kind of a nice week. Um, yes, as Jeff, as Jeff shared, I'm the youth pastor at Wistosha Lakes Church. Um, I've known the Talberts for six years, uh, worked with Jeff for four years prior to his coming out here to join you guys. Um, and yeah, we're, we're out here uh, dropping Rochelle off. Uh, my family I actually grew up in Philadelphia, just three hours south of here, so that's part of the the plan. So we're dropping Rochelle off and then going to go spend Thanksgiving with my family uh, this week. And so Jeff said, hey, while you're out here, do you want to preach? Uh, and give me a, give me a, a week off. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll preach. A um, couple things you need to know about me uh, and, and my wife, Becca, who's over here. We have four cats, uh, Winston, Wanda, Pretzel, and Oliver Otis Howard the I. Uh, they keep us busy. Rochelle has been a tremendous help keeping them, <laughs> keeping them in line. Um, I love fried chicken, and uh, there's nothing else to say about that. I just thought it'd be fun to share. And I, if I'm, if I'm not uh, reading or studying, I'm probably playing a game, specifically a board game, if I can get people to play it with me, and I'm not talking about Monopoly or Uno. Um, I just played my first game of Frosthaven the other night, and so those of you who know what that is will understand uh, what kind of games we're talking about. I love board games uh, and how they bring people together uh, to drive us crazy with the insane rules and uh, strategies, and sometimes we get angry at each other. But anyway, I love board games. Uh, one other thing I need to address is this. Um, so I didn't get shoved into a locker. I <laughs> This week, I accidentally sat on my glasses and broke them in half, uh, and I did not have time to get new ones, so there's duct tape on them, and I'm using the mic clip to hold them on, but if they fall off my face while I'm talking, that's why, so I just wanted to <laughs> prep you for that, that it may occur uh, while I'm talking. So, today, as Jeff maybe alluded to in his prayer, we're going to spend some time talking about anger. Um, I thought, you know, it's, it's Thanksgiving week, and a lot of us are going to be gathering with relatives, and some of us may be gathering with relatives that drive us a little bit up the wall sometimes. Um, as we gather with people that we only see once a year, maybe that's not you, but if, if it's not you, well, you're still probably have faced anger recently. Um, and so we're, we're just going to see what Jesus has to say about uh, anger from Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26 which I'm going to read in a moment, but before I do that, I want to tell you a story you may or may not have heard before. Um, in 1955, uh, there were five missionaries who made contact with a group of uh, Alka people in Ecuador, Africa, a tribe known as the Waodani. Um, this tribe was especially known for its brutality and its hatred of outsiders. Um, no one had been able to make contact, but these five men decided to try and make inroads, inroads with them to share the gospel. Initially, things seemed promising as they were able to make contact with some of the women of the tribe and even take them on a plane ride to show them the wonders of, of technology. Um, conversations were happening. It seemed like there was positive progress, but that was not the case. On January 8th, 1956, 10 Waodani warriors came out of the woods while these five missionaries were in the river and murdered them in cold blood, leaving their bodies in the river, leaving their wives and children without their husbands and fathers. And so I ask you, how would you respond in that situation? If that was your father, brother, child, friend that was killed in that river, what emotions would guide your actions and thoughts in the coming days? I imagine sadness would be first among them, but I have to also imagine that anger would be close behind. Why would they do this? Why would they take this person from me? Jesus has some words of wisdom for us in these kinds of situations, as well as ones that are far less extreme, as we'll see. So, if you would... I've given you plenty of time to turn there if you were planning to, but it's also going to be on the screen behind me if you uh, would prefer to read it that way. Uh, as I read uh, Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You have heard it said, excuse me, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. 
Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus wants to be very clear about something, and so I'm going to be very clear about it right up front. The first idea that he wants to get across is that anger is murdering someone in your heart. Let me explain. First of all, Jesus starts off his teaching by saying, you have heard that it was said to those of old. He's setting a pattern for the next couple of points. We're kind of jumping into the middle here, but this is a section of the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is giving a long teaching over the courses of Matthew 5 through 7. And the next couple teachings, he's going to start this way. You've heard that it was said. And what Jesus is trying to get across here is, hey, there's this command that you've heard, this law that you've heard. But I'm going to tell you something about this command that you may not have understood. There's a deeper meaning here. Jesus has also just said that he's come to fulfill the law, not to get rid of it. And he's demonstrating how he's going to do that. I'm not erasing the law, you shall not murder, right? Not saying that's okay. But I am saying that there's something more to this that I'm going to show you. So the command that Jesus references, he starts out with a softball. (laughs) Exodus 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. He goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments for this first of these teachings. There's no one in his audience that's disagreeing with this, right? (laughs) These are Jews. They understand that murder is bad. They don't think it's okay to take someone's life, at least not without purpose. And it's worth going back and looking at Exodus 20 for just a second, because the word word God uses in Exodus 20 is the Hebrew word ratzach, which is different from the much more common word hareg. Both mean to take a life, but hareg is much more common. It's used for accidental killing or killing that's even commanded by God in certain situations to bring about justice, Um, war, among other things. It's used about 167 times. But ratzach is much more rare. It's only used 47 times in the Old Testament. This is exclusively premeditated, unjustified manslaughter. So that's what Jesus is referring to. He's using that command because it's a very specific thing. It's not just any killing. And the reason that's important is because in Numbers 35, God lays out the expectations for those who commit ratzach, and that's death. Those who take a life unjustly receive the fruit of their own actions. So here's the twist. Jesus lays out this three-step argument that gets more and more intense. Okay, you've heard it said that murder leads to judgment, right? But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And remember what that judgment is. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. This word liable ties together these four phrases to make a point. Jesus says, yes, those who murder are liable to judgment, but also those who are angry are liable to the same judgment. What does Jesus mean by anger? The word he uses, or gidzo, isn't one of those situations where there's a deeper meaning. When you read it in the Greek, you unlock the key, <laughs> the key meaning. It means what it says to make someone or to be angry, but the reason it's worth mentioning is because whenever this shows up in the New Testament, it's associated with judgment most of the time. What's interesting is that when the subject of this word is a human being, it's generally a negative thing. But when God uses it, or there's a parable where the main character is a stand-in for God, it's a positive thing. The American Psychological Association defines anger as an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something you feel has deliberately done you wrong. So, to be angry in this context is to have a negative disposition towards someone because of a perceived slight against you, whether that's a real or fictional. So Jesus says anyone who feels this towards another person is in the same place as someone who has committed murder. Then he goes on 
When you insult another person, you're liable to the same judgment via the counsel that brings that judgment. He's drawing attention to the way when we get angry, we often resort to name-calling, childish behavior. It's just kind of spiraling down. And then it gets worse. Raise your hand if you've ever called somebody a fool. Okay, so I have your attention, I hope. That wasn't a rhetorical, I raised my hand too, right? So, whoever calls someone you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay. The word Jesus uses here is the word Gehenna. Um, And that's a real place. Our Bibles often translate it hell because it was a very common idiom. But this is a real place in the Valley of Hinnon, just outside of Jerusalem. There's a picture of it, uh, should be on the screen behind me. Uh, of what this looks like. Oh yeah, it's back there too. I don't have to turn around. Uh, So this is a real place that you can go to if you're in Israel. Um, And the reason this was such a common idiom is because it was essentially the dumping grounds. So dead bodies, waste, dead animal, like anything would just get thrown in this valley and they would light it on fire. And it would burn day and night as a raging inferno. So I have an artist's rendition uh, of what this may have looked like. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I made that in like five minutes. Uh, So it was a very common image for people when thinking about what does judgment look like? Well, Gehenna is what judgment looks like. It's not a place you want to be. Why does Jesus do this? This progression serves a purpose. Jesus wants to surprise and shock his audience. He wants to establish this principle that anger destroys harmony. It's not a good thing. It's a cycle of temptation that alienates us from God and alienates us from our neighbor. It often helps us feel superior. When we lean on anger, it's, well, I'm, I'm the right one here. I'm the one who's been wronged. I'm right and you're wrong. And we elevate ourselves and put down others in our anger quite often. And Jesus wants to make it clear that this is not a Christian way of living. And this is what happens when we try to follow the law for the law's sake. The command is do not murder. So we see don't murder. Okay, easy. I won't do that. Right? How many of us have read that commandment many times over and just kind of skipped over it because like, well, I've never done that. <laughs> I, don't have to, I don't have to worry about that one. Uh, maybe... Uh, idolatry is harder, taking the Lord's name in vain, or even coveting, that's a hard one. But murder, I got that one. It's fine. So Jesus is saying, when we look at don't murder as purely that law, and we're just following the letter of the law, we tend towards anger, towards hate, because we let that bitterness in our heart that we're not actually taking action on (laughs) turn into something else, and it leads to backbiting and name-calling and ultimately judgment. So I hear maybe some of you thinking, but Micah, what about righteous anger? What about racial injustice or the abuse of children or or, uh, poverty and income inequality? Sorry, that phrase was really hard for me to get out. Income inequality was what I was trying to get to. What about these things that are severe problems? Shouldn't we be righteously angry about those things? Now, first of all, this passage is primarily about personal offense. Jesus is talking about when someone offends us or we've offended someone else and we're restoring that relational harmony. He's not primarily talking about big-scale issues uh, that don't necessarily affect us personally, but I think we'd still be remiss to not briefly address the idea of righteous anger. Righteous anger is very rarely used to describe human beings in Scripture. Um, God is righteously angry all the time. But human beings, it's only a handful of times. One of the most notable is when Moses is in the presence of God on Mount Sinai, literally sees the back of God, face is glowing, and he comes down the mountain, and what does he find but the people of God worshiping an idol? Even as he has just been in the presence of God. And in that moment, Moses was righteously angry at his people. But I think we need to be careful <laughs> in putting ourselves in the place of Moses in that situation, because most of us aren't Moses, freshly from the presence of God, right? That's not where we've been the last couple days. 
A text that always comes up when we talk about anger is uh, Luke 19, 45 through 48. And this is the account. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, if someone ever says, what would Jesus do? Just remember that flipping over tables is an option, right? I've heard that said to me many times as a joke in passing. Well, you know, Jesus was angry. And this, this account actually shows up in most of the Gospels, for sure Luke and John, and I think in Matthew as well, but I can't remember if it's in Mark. Jesus is righteously angry. He sees the money changers making a mockery of God's house and robbing people blind. And so in that moment, he channels his anger and he righteously flips over the tables and whips them into submission and gets them out of the temple, right? Righteous anger. I would challenge you to read every account of that story in every gospel that it appears and point to me where it says Jesus was angry. I checked, so you don't actually have to do that. The word anger doesn't show up (laughs) in the entire narrative of the Gospels, in that story at least. We just assume that. Now, that's not to say I can say definitively that Jesus wasn't angry. He might have been. But I think it's just a, a good lesson in being careful in what we read from our minds into the text that maybe isn't there. So just keep that in mind. And then another place people go, I'm going to actually read this, is Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 or Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. This is a letter from Paul, right? So if I'm reading Paul correctly, as long as I don't sin while I'm angry, I'm okay, right? I can, I can be angry and not sin. I think that interpretation misses the point a little bit. Let me ask you this. Should a blind person be permitted to carry a gun? Maybe. Probably not a good idea, right? It's not to say anything bad about the person who is unable to see, but that's not a wise decision, right? The gun isn't the problem in that situation. It's the ability of the person to wield it. It would be a danger to everyone around them would that per- should that person decide to use that weapon. Jesus is saying that anger is not a virtue. It's dangerous, in the hands of humans who are not capable of wielding it properly. And so we shouldn't tolerate it anywhere near us. The best we can do if we find ourselves in anger is not sin any further by giving into it. And a lot of people will quote uh, Ephesians 4, 26, at least the first part, and say, be angry and do not sin. But right after that, Paul says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Anger is an opportunity for the devil. It's not something we should be trying to wield. Just real quick, as an end to this aside, an alternative. While righteous anger is rarely a human trait, something that's much more common in Scripture is lament and sorrow. So when we see injustice in our world, the narrative of Scripture would lead us not towards picking up our pitchforks, but towards our knees, towards the Psalms, not towards Facebook, to vent our frustration. When we see injustice that leads us to anger, what if we turned instead to prayer and to lament and fasting over these things that really we feel like should make us angry? So returning to our passage, what do we do when we find ourselves angry? Because I'm not saying that it's, we should, well, Jesus is not saying that we should just not be angry, right? That's what we would expect. If this is so serious, Jesus' next word should be, then don't be angry. But they're not. Instead, he tells a parable. It's a very short parable, but a parable nonetheless. Verse uh, 23 and 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus knows that saying don't be angry is an impossible task. And what's ironic about that is if that was his command, we'd be right back to square one. Because the original problem is when we look at the law, do not murder, and we say, okay, good, I'm following the law and not worrying about our heart. So if the, the command was just another prohibitive command, 
We're right back where we started. So instead, he gives a prescriptive command. Instead of an impossible ideal, he offers a practical antidote. Reconcile quickly because anger is murder in the heart. That's our second point. The the antidote to anger is not stop being angry, it's reconcile. And this parable that he tells illustrates that. What's interesting is that in this parable, it's when your brother or sister has something against you, meaning you're the one who's the offender in this situation. It's not even that someone's offended you, you've offended someone else. And what's funny about this story, you can put the map up, Jesus is telling this parable in Galilee. The situation he's describing is likely at the temple in Jerusalem, 80 miles to the south. This is a pilgrimage that Israelites would make maybe a few times in their life, not every year. So it's not every day you get to go offer your sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, if you're standing at the altar, getting ready to make your sacrifice, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, drop your sacrifice, make the week-long trip up to Galilee and back, and reconcile with that person before you make your offering. This is obviously a little bit of hyperbole. (laughs) But the point is that reconciliation and relationship is even more important than worship as far as Jesus is concerned. As important as worship is, and in that day and age, the sacrificial system was incredibly important. Reconciliation and right relationship in the face of conflict and anger is even more important. I tell you a story of a way this played out in my life. When I was in, I went to, I went to school at Cedarville University for my undergrad. Um, it's where I met Becca, uh, and it was a Baptist college. So when I tell you that I was an RA my junior year, know that it was about the most boring job you can imagine. Uh, there wasn't even they weren't even allowed to sell alcohol in the town the college was in because the university bought all the liquor licenses back in the day. This was a very boring campus in terms of RA responsibilities. The most demanding thing I had to deal with was one one day some kids were playing soccer in my hall and hit the fire uh, alarm and broke it. And I had to like write an email about it. That was like the most involved thing I had to do as an RA. But as a part of this job, I had a key that got me into any room in the hall in the event of an emergency or a room check or something like that. Uh, And so one day I was playing uh, games with some of the guys in my hall, uh, and we realized that one of the controllers didn't have any batteries in it, and so we weren't going to be able to play Halo. But I remembered that across the hall, my friend... Uh, I, I kept my, now I have to be careful in this part of the story. Um, I've told it before, and I say we, and people think I say weed, but I'm referring to the Nintendo console made uh, in 2007, not the uh, narcotic plant. Uh, I kept my Wii in his room, because that's where we played Smash Brothers, um, and I knew that in that room there were some controllers of mine that had batteries in them, but he wasn't there. And so in a moment of foolishness, I used my privileges as an RA to get into his room without his permission to get my controller so that I could charge the other controller and we could play Halo. And I was very careful to put everything back exactly how it was so that he wouldn't notice that I was in there. I knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew he would not appreciate that, but I did it anyway. Despite my sneakiness, he confronted me about it. The next time I saw him, were you in my room? Did you use your key to get in without my permission? I said, yes. That wasn't cool, man. Now, he could have done a number of things. How big of a deal was it really? If it was me in his place, would I really make a big deal of it? Is it worth risking that relationship to bring up this minor inconvenience? I gotta be honest, if I'm in his position, I don't know that I would. But his choice to confront me about my shortcomings immediately is part of the reason he's still one of my closest friends to this day, six years later. See, that, that impulse to reconcile immediately and not let the anger fester in his heart for what I did has allowed our friendship to flourish years later. 
allowed that relationship to be restored because it gave me an opportunity to apologize, say, I'm sorry, that was wrong of me, and begin to rebuild that trust that I lost. It's a very minor example of the power of reconciliation to fix anger, to restore relationship when anger threatens it. But Micah, Jesus is talking about Christians here, right? He's talking about other believers. It doesn't say never to be angry with anyone. This is just for relationships in the church. I turn your attention to parable number two. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This parable adds two things. The first is that up to this point, every other party in the parables has been referred to as brother or sister. In this parable, that's absent. On top of that, the accuser is bringing this person to court, which is something that is later commanded not of believers to do, right? Don't bring a brother or sister to court. So this is in all likelihood someone who's outside the community of faith. And nevertheless, Jesus commands to reconcile quickly in that situation. While The command to reconcile certainly has greater ramifications for those of us inside the kingdom. It doesn't exclude reconciliation with non-believers. So by the logic of this passage, if you offend someone, again, you're the offender in this situation. In both of these parables, you're the one who's made the offense. It's still our responsibility to resolve that conflict, even if they aren't a believer, to settle accounts in that situation. But the second thing that this parable adds, which I think is even more important, is the eschatological reality Jesus is presenting here. Let me explain. When Jesus says, truly I say to you, that's his hint that we need to pay attention. Something big is about to come. Something weighty is about to follow. So Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is saying, reconcile with urgency because I'm not just talking about earthly courts. Those who live outside the bounds of the new kingdom that Jesus is establishing will be judged as those who are outside the kingdom. If we're not living with reconciliation and forgiving hearts, then forgiveness may not come to us. When Jesus says, come to terms quickly, lest you be handed over to the judge, he's alluding to the final judgment of God. And those who don't reconcile with others won't be reconciled to him. So this is a weighty command. So what do we do? What do we do with this? And broadly speaking, Jesus is telling us that we need to be agents of reconciliation. That goes for when we're offended as well. Jesus doesn't say that in this Uh, in either of these parables, but it's implied that when we're offended, when someone hurts us and we have anger towards them because of it, it may feel easier to stuff it down, to just pretend like it didn't happen, to go about our day and our week. But that's like trying to soothe your wound with butter. It's a gross image. It might feel good for a second, but it's going to get infected. It's going to get gross as it festers. The longer we keep anger in, the more it worsens. And Jesus says, be quick to reconcile, not just don't be angry. Because that's the antidote, right, for our wounds, is to reconcile. So what relationships are festering right now? Who has offended you that you may need to reconcile with? To take that anger and put it on the table and say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. We need to do something about it. Posturing our heart towards others when we're angry. Because anger isn't... Anger is like a warning bell. It lets us know that something's wrong and we need to do something about it. Relational harmony is at risk. So when we feel that anger, don't wait. Maybe an appropriate amount of of prayer and wisdom to, to prepare for that encounter, but don't hold on to it for too long. It's dangerous. That also goes for when we are the offender, just like in both of the parables that Jesus tells This requires an alertness for how our actions affect others, to have empathetic hearts as we go about our day asking, did what I say hurt that person? 
How did my actions affect them? And is their relational harmony at risk? Is there possibly anger that they have towards me? And just as an aside, it's always better to have these conversations in person. It may be tempting to resolve things via text or social media, and uh, those areas are minefields for misunderstanding. They, they lower the stakes of the conversation. I would strongly encourage you in person have these conversations. When we have anger, we have to work through. Um, the digital space often makes things worse. So we're supposed to be agents of reconciliation, but there's two caveats to that that I want to I wanna close with. The first is, what if they won't reconcile? Or what if they can't reconcile? Paul will echo this sentiment later in Romans 12. This is something Jeff used to say to me all the time, and he probably still says it. He writes, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Did you try did you try to reconcile? And in that effort, did you resolve the anger in your own heart? Because our hearts are what we're responsible for. We're not responsible for the hearts of others. Did we make an effort? This brings to mind a comparison between Jesus, or no, between Peter and Judas. Both of these men grievously wounded Jesus. They betrayed him. But only one of them had a heart to reconcile have to imagine that if Judas had turned his heart back towards Jesus and sought reconciliation, Jesus would have welcomed him with open arms. But even Jesus was not able to reconcile that relationship because Judas didn't turn his heart toward Jesus. Peter did. As far as it depends on you. But what if it's someone who's out of my life, right? Maybe what I'm saying is dredging up anger from a decade ago. And this person's no longer a part of your life, but you've been holding on to that for a long time. Again, what can you control? Can you make peace in your own heart? By prayer and supplication, can you bring that anger to a place where you can forgive or ask for forgiveness, even if they can't settle it on, on their end? Getting your heart right with God. And in this situation, I would say, maybe uh, social media is an or texting is an appropriate way to reconcile, or writing a letter or something like that, where they're not really in your life anymore, but reaching out uh, uh, virtually or from a distance may be, may be possible. And the second caveat I would give, the first one, what if they can't? The second one is, what if I can't? What I'm saying might sound really good in a normal circumstance, but Micah, you don't know the hurt that I've been dealt you don't know how badly this person has wounded me. It might not even be safe for me to reconcile with this person. They've done something so horrible that I can't even be in their presence. I would turn your attention back to um, the story I told at the beginning. On the screen behind me is Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth was the wife of Jim Elliot. Jim was one of the men killed in that river. When her husband was killed, her kids also lost their father. And she had a choice. She could have returned to the United States, perhaps even gotten remarried, found a job, taken care of her kids. But instead, she chose to go back. She went back to the people who murdered her husband and took her whole world from her. And she began working. She began translating the Bible into their language. She began building relationships with the people who murdered her husband. And as a part of her efforts and several other women, the, nearly the entire Waodani tribe came to know Jesus. To the point where even the man who murdered her husband was baptized in the river where he killed him. If that's not a picture of biblical reconciliation, I don't know what is. These are the situations where the rubber meets the road of the Christian life. It's easy for me to stand up here and tell you that the Bible says you should make peace with the person who called you a mean name on Facebook or who keeps letting their dog poop on your lawn. But what do you do when someone hurts your child? When someone takes the life of someone close to you? 
I've got to be honest, I don't know. I haven't been in that situation. I haven't faced it. So I'm not in a position to speak to any of you who might be in that situation where someone has done something so awful that just reconciliation seems impossible. But I know someone who does know what that's like. His name is God. He watched his people hurt and murdered his only son as they spat on him and beat him and nailed to a cross and mocked him. And yet his forgiveness, his reconciliation that was being created by that very act was for the people killing him. So if Jesus can stand here on the mount knowing what's going to happen to him in several years, knowing the people who are going to murder him may even be in his audience and say, reconcile quickly, because anger is murder in the heart, then it must be possible. I offer you three sort of guiding principles, just from scripture, not from my own experience. First, bathe these challenges in prayer. If this is you, if you're facing a situation where I just, I can't reconcile, it's too deep, the wound is too great, take it to God, bathe it in prayer. Second, Remember that reconciliation is different than forgetting. It doesn't mean your relationship is going to look the same or even continue. That relationship may be long gone, or maybe it never existed at all. Reconciliation is different from forgetting what they've done. It's about our heart before God and our forgiveness towards them. And third, Jesus knows your pain. And he's the one who gives us the strength to do the impossible and to forgive when we feel like we can't. Let's just let's close in a word of prayer. God, we know that the Christian life is not always easy. And you sometimes call us to things that feel hard and even foolish to some. God, why should I forgive when someone has made no effort to forgive me or to reconcile with me. And in those moments when we have those thoughts, let our hearts turn towards Jesus, who took the first step to reconcile a whole world that hated him and turned its back on him. God, we ask that your spirit would indwell us and strengthen us to work through these difficult emotions of anger and even hatred that you would give us the strength to turn our hearts towards one another towards those who offend towards those who hurt that we would be agents of reconciliation in a world that is constantly wanting to fight when anger is driving the ship that we would be able to put it in the back seat and let forgiveness and grace take charge Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.